Okay, welcome to the uh, third media meetup of the year. First media and Mongo the second year. This year, or this year. Like I said, it's a joint meetup without joints. So, bad jokes. But anyway, uh, so I just want to find out who signed up from the media side of this meetup. Okay, so there's more than I thought, because we were a bit worried that there was any Mongo people here. So, uh, so there's going to be some one talk on uh, media or dynamic collections from Ken, and then two uh, two interesting talks from the Mongo side. Lawrence with the Steam Design, and Stephen has come all the way from Australia. Uh, talk about using Mongo in production. So uh, should be really interesting. Uh, if you don't know much about Meteor, we're not really going to cover the basics tonight, but I recommend checking out Meteor.com. Very simple tutorial to learn about, you know, a very uh, easy way to build full stack applications on JavaScript. Uh, we also have a meetup group, which is not linked to Mongo. If you want to learn more and come to our meetup groups, we have a Facebook page, Facebook group, and we have a very quiet Slack team. So, uh, <laughs> you're welcome to join that too. Anyway, first talk is uh, Lawrence, MongoDB Schema Design. Okay, so most of you, <laughs> most of you probably will have heard that uh, Lee Kuan Yew died this week. So as with most other meetups happening in Singapore this week, let's start with a moment of silence for all respect on you. So yeah, today I'll be talking about MongoDB schema design. It'll be a really short talk. So I looked at how the MongoDB evangelists talk about schema design and they could give hour long talks and I have no idea how they do it. I just ramble on about simple things. So I'll make it short and sweet and if you have any questions, just raise your hand and ask. Don't be shy. So yeah, what are we talking about? So how quick show of hands, how many of you guys here have used MongoDB before? Okay, so I don't have to talk anymore, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> we'll be talking about documents and uh, strategies, how you create, like what's the schema you should have for each document and how do you define relationships between different documents because much as you hate joints, you will ha have to have documents that are related to each other in one way or another. So yeah, terminology first. So since you guys most all use Mongo here, so I don't need to go through this crap. Yeah, but this is basically a one-to-one -one mapping between the normal RDBMS terms and the MongoDB terminology. So what are documents? So documents are actually, uh, they were made popular by MongoDB. Uh, they are basically JSON objects. They call it binary JSON in MongoDB. And they allow you to have, allow you a lot of flexibility in defining what your data looks like. So it's pretty much a standard JSON object. You can put in a new key, you can put in an array anywhere, you can put in a new object and an object. So it's really very flexible. And yeah, so uh, for normalized data, so let's take a look between normalized data and denormalized data. So for your regular RDBMS, so how many of you guys here have actually used RDBMS before? Okay, so you guys have used both. That's good. So, in, so let's take a block for example, right? If you are creating a block for yourself, you probably need like five different tables. One table for your article, one table for your user, one table for comments, one for categories and one for text. And what happens is that you will need foreign keys to join all these tables together so that when you need a blog post, the database can work its magic, join everything together and get your data out. Is that right? Or is there any other way of doing it? No one has any other ways of doing it? Okay. I'm not wrong there. <laughs> So yeah, so you can have uh, multiple users. I see you can have one user per comment, and you have a user for the article, and then article can have multiple comments and stuff like that. So this is how a normalized database will look like in a regular RDBMS. And this is how the normalized set of data will look like. In the article object, you have an array of comments, you have an array of text, you have an array of categories. And then in each of these comments, you reference a user in each of the articles you reference a user as well. 
So you basically store the user's ID. Yeah. So can someone tell me what's the pros of this first? Like why would you want to use this and not the other one? No duplication. Okay, no duplication. But this has no duplication too, right? But in MongoDB, you cannot get those parts too, right? Consistency. What about consistency? Is it a real but you can do updates in all, right? In MongoDB, you just update one object, the object is updated. In the RDBMS, you start a transaction, you update all the stuff in end transaction. So both have autonomy, right? What's your? Something that is guaranteed. What do I guarantee? Guarantee something. Guarantee what? <laughs> okay. Okay. So yeah. So what's the pattern? So basically, long story short, right? Uh, the MongoDB guys actually spent like ten minutes talking about this. I'm gonna spend one minute. So in RDBMS, when you look at how you structure data, database uh, structure in RDBMS, you look at how you store the data, and the main thing you ask yourself is, you know, can I join stuff together to store less data? So as you can see from here, right, each of the articles will have, will have to store the user ID, each of the comments will have to store the user ID, which takes up quite a bit of space if you have a lot of applications. Whereas in the RDBMS, like Postgres, for example, if you have a foreign key, they actually optimize that and you store less data as a result. Yeah, they, they kind of have ways to minimize the footprint. So you look at how you store data in RDBMS. Whereas from the perspective of a document schema, you look at how you want to retrieve the data. So yeah, that is the main thing, I guess. So yeah, embedding versus reference. How many of you are familiar with this terminology? So who wants to tell me the difference between them? Come on, guys. Okay. One is embedding, one is reference. <laughs> <laughs> what is embedding? You keep it in the same document. Okay. And what's referencing? Huh? Okay. Yeah, correct. <clears throat> so who here have tried doing references in MongoDB? How was the experience like? Okay. Okay, so yeah, background story, I've actually worked at a startup that, I'm not going to name who they are, but uh, they actually had like references everywhere, they use MongoDB like a RDBMS, so they had like thousands of reference per page load. So it took like 30 seconds for them to load a single page, because they had so much processing the data to handle all the references, because MongoDB doesn't have foreign keys. So if you do references, it's quite expensive, so be aware of when you use it. So yeah, in a blog post, right? Like in this case, for example, when your comment is outside the article, it's more of a reference kind of model because you need the article, no, you need the comments to refer to which article they belong to. Uh, so one of the key things about using reference, right? The main benefits of using reference is that it allows you to have more flexibility when you query the objects. You can filter it easily, whereas if you put it in an array, MongoDB doesn't really have much query operators for you to use to do things the way you like it. Like for example, if you want to do a regex search, in MongoDB they'll be very expensive because they don't index the arrays very well. So yeah, it, it gives you more flexibility to use references. On the other hand, if you use embed, it gives you much better speeds when you query for data because when you query for the thing, you get a whole chunk out in one shot. And one of the things that I've heard people mention to me when they say that embedding is bad is that <coughs> what if you have so many comments that it's more than 16 megabytes? So my response to that all the time is always the whole of Shakespeare's, one of Shakespeare's longest novels is 5 megabytes. So it's not too much data. Like text is not a lot of data in the first place. So yeah, I guess uh, always figure out your use case if you are going to grab the data individually a lot. 
use references if you're going to grab the data as a whole all the time, use embedding. And general rule of thumb, if there's a lot of the thing, keep in a separate collection. If you know there's a small amount, like maybe 10 of this in every object, you can just embed it and it, wouldn't, it shouldn't be much of a problem. And the great thing about MongoDB is you can always change it later on. Just write a couple of scripts to do a migration and get that. So yeah, I've hit 8 minutes 30 seconds. I finished my talk kind of. So any questions? Can you do a hybrid? Huh? Yeah, you can do a hybrid. So for example, right, for the case of the blog post <coughs> that I use here. Uh, wait. So as you can see, these are all embedded. But this is a reference. So that it doesn't make sense to store the user in each of these comments and articles because it happens too many times. And if you want to update the user, you have to update everywhere, right? So in this case, it makes more, it makes more sense to use a reference. But for the comments itself, each of them are unique. So in this case, embedding works better. Yeah. Yes? Ah, yes, that was. Correct. So, it, MongoDB by itself doesn't actually enforce the integrity of the data. Uh, you, most of the time, people do using ORMs that they use. So, for example, in Node.js, there's this uh, Mongoose library that allows you to enforce integrity of between the references. So if you delete like the reference and then if you delete one of the things where well, if you delete the reference that a lot of other things are referring to, it will show you an error. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that is a lot more difficult. Like you need to remove from each of them. So you need to think about your use case, right? In this case, for the blog use case, you don't remove categories all the time. So, yeah. So the same it, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do it well. Like yes. Correct. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So related to that uh, concept as well, right? So maybe you can share with us, like, uh, what are sort of type of applications that probably will do that? OK. Okay, so if you're building a financial system or a PayPal, because I work at PayPal, right? You don't want to be using MongoDB to store your users' transactions because you can't enforce the transactions and you can't do rollbacks on. I mean, you can do using a two phase comment, but it's too much of, a, of work to do. So you rather pay to use Oracle or some enterprise level database to handle all this for you. Uh, MongoDB is good. I mean, one of the reasons why I use MongoDB a lot is because. There's a lot of platforms that give you free MongoDB databases, 500 megabytes. And then you put a sharding instance in front of it and you get as much as you want. So yeah, that's one of the main reasons why I use MongoDB. But uh, one of the good things I find for MongoDB is if you have applications that you have not clearly defined what the data looks like. So in that case, you can just dump in stuff easily. And another good thing for MongoDB is uh, logging. So at PayPal, we're actually currently looking at using MongoDB to handle one of the logging all the logs for our applications. So the good thing about that is that you can actually store the logs in the full text and then you can just do your processing on the logs, store it in some random JSON format. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, just throw it away and just try again. And you don't have to do auto tape and stuff like that. So uh, I'll just share with you one of the stories I heard from the MongoDB evangelist actually. So Craigslist, no, yeah, yeah Craigslist. They were actually using MySQL a, a long time ago. So it reached a point where, so they have a lot of entry coming every day. So it reached a point where take, doing an auto table would take months. So every time they want to add a new field to their system, it's a couple of months of auto table. So they had this archive database and they had like production database. So production database was like every three months to move it back. They'll move it into the archive and then they'll start a new fresh database kind of thing. So it reached a point where auto, doing the auto table on the archive database would take so many months that the main database will start getting too slow. 
and that's why they switched to Mongo. So that's the kind of, I guess if you need flexibility and you don't really need integrity of data, MongoDB is a good choice. Yeah. Any more questions? No? Yes. But you can do two-phase commits to ensure integrity, and but you have to do your own rollbacks and stuff. <coughs> yeah, that's handled in Mongoose. Or no, you have to write it yourself, which is quite painful. But so you basically have to record down all the transactions you do in the two-phase commit, and then you perform those transactions, and have a way to roll back if have another worker to roll back if something goes wrong there. Yeah, so you have to set a timer and stuff. So so, so as long as as long as you're able as long as you're able to do that, then there must be use cases where it makes sense to actually have the same data in two different collections, and one collection is embedded in the document, yeah, and another right. collection you've got a for performance like lookup table. Or yes, whatever. for performance reasons. So uh, one of the, oh yeah, another way I use MongoDB before is actually caching. So I have cases where I store my data, so I need some data to have certain level of integrity, right? So I store those data in the RDBMS, but when I'm fetching the data out, I actually cache them in MongoDB in the weird structures that I need my front end, my front end service in the data in. So uh, basically a compound version of the data. And then I'll just flush the cache once in a while. And you'll get your game from RDBMS and put it in there. So yeah, that's another way I use MongoDB. Any more questions? Um, when So, so for the GitCamp SG page, we actually, but that was two years ago, I actually benchmarked MongoDB versus my SQL plus Memcache. So on the whole, if you can fit your entire thing in memory, MongoDB is almost on par with Memcache. Yeah, but once it goes into this, you start swapping all stuff. And MongoDB isn't that good at handling memory because you can't limit like how much memory you can use. You just keep absorbing and absorbing until the whole system's memory becomes yeah, which is kind of sad. I'm, I'm not sure if they fix it in 3.0 though, but as of 2.8, they're still having the problem. Yeah, whereas, you know, in my, in my SQL, you can say, you know, I give my SQL 256 megabytes of RAM, it will never go away. In MongoDB, you just absorb, absorb, absorb. So if you run an app server beside it, you're okay. Yeah. Yes. question, but knowing that MongoDB is not very safe for transaction, but are there any big players who use MongoDB for... Uh, Craigslist is a rather big player that's using MongoDB. Foursquare. Four four uh, no, not, not transactions. Like. I mean, maybe which, which, like, which big company use MongoDB for like, transactions? What do you mean by transactions? I mean, like, because you, usually, you know, you, if you use RDBMS, you have to check whether, like, how to say, two-way commit something. Yeah, yeah two-phase commit, yeah. yeah. I just it wonder, doesn't. are there any big players who use MongoDB purely to do transaction online? You mean financial transactions? Yes. Uh, as of now, I don't think there's any that dares to do that. What about yet. someone like Guild, is that uh, Guild Group? Because the guy behind Guild Group is the... Uh, I'm not too sure what that is. I'm not... I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Ah, but they... So they probably have a payment giveaway backing up the data, right? Yeah. Well, well yeah. no, they, they, these are the guys who actually started the Ah, okay. <coughs> I'm not too sure about that. I haven't had a lot of them. Yes. Uh, so I've actually used Couch before. It's, the way you think about it is actually quite different. So CouchDB, I'm not, wait, I'm not too sure if I'm missing out another one. CouchDB does versioning, right? Does it do versioning? Well, I, I okay, I'm not in but. I remember one of the ways, so MongoDB, the way you scale up is you scale up horizontally, whereas for CouchDB, you scale up by adding, by making your server more powerful. The sharding part of CouchDB is that powerful. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not aware enough about Couch to make that distinction. Yes. Just one more question, you know. Okay, uh, for now in the market, there's a lot of database you use, like, Postgres SQL, yes. no SQL, and now the newest language like MariaDB, the, mm. the guy who used to create my SQL, yes, now correct. create a MariaDB. So, in your opinion, which 
which database should we use? Let's use the one that's the cheapest to deploy. Cheap. Okay, if it's for your own personal app, just find the one that's free. But if you are doing it for work, like if you are intending to run a proper company around it, yeah. go for one of the best enterprise support. So which one has the best? For best enterprise support, it's probably Oracle. Oracle. <laughs> Their speeds are pretty good. Their NoSQL speeds are actually pretty good. I've used it. I've used Oracle's NoSQL before. They are up there. But yeah, you need to pay for that thing. So. <laughs> But yeah, if you, are, you don't want to pay for it, Postgres is probably one of the better options to go with. There's a lot of documentation online. Yeah. Yes? I think on the referencing, is there, was there something about one-way and two-way referencing? Like so it's basically just adding one more ID on the other side to reference back, right? Uh, is there a reason why you do that rather than... So let's say if you need to get to a comment from the article, you need to get from the article from the comment, you need to you need it on both sides. It's like a link list. If you need it on both sides, you need it on both sides. If you don't, you don't. Yeah. Any more questions? No? Okay. That's it.